Welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. This podcast is a production of ElevateNonprofit.com, an online learning platform for fundraising event professionals. We're coming to you today from the studios of the AV department. Please welcome our hosts, Kristen Steele and Samantha Swaim. Welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we are all headed up. We are so excited to have Clay joining us today, who... Clay, I know we have an official bio we're going to introduce you with, but you, in my mind, are like the wizard behind the nonprofit scenes that helps nonprofits figure out the puzzle pieces. It's like we have 32 puzzle pieces on the table. How do they actually fit together? And so we're excited to dive into one of your many super talents. I think you are like the one who mirrors the nonprofit the most by switching hats and having lots of different skill sets you bring to the table. But Kristen, let's introduce the audience to Clay. For the official bio, let's go. Clay Buck calls himself a recovering actor and a reluctant data geek, (laughs) but fundamentally, he's a fundraiser. He's been in fundraising since the late 90s, yes, (laughs) and remembers when the master database was a file cabinet full of carbon copies and three by five cards. Maybe for some of you, it still is. Clay's worked as a fundraiser at nonprofits all over the country, most recently in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's also been a consultant with with large national firms and recently launched his own company, TCB Fundraising, that focuses on fundraising and communication strategies for individual giving. He's the co-creator of the Fundraiser's Planner and hosts the podcast, Fundraising is funny. Clay's a dog dad to two poorly trained golden retrievers who have practically mastered the art of the ask, especially at dinner time. We're so, so grateful you're here. So, Clay, please tell us, why is fundraising funny? What about fundraising isn't funny? <laughs> true. This is true. This Fair. is true. If you th- if you think about it, no, really think about it. Think about what giving is, right? If we, if we look at it from the donor's perspective, and honestly, donors, like we use this word donors, like they're this big mystical creature, right? <laughs> donors are just humans who give. So donors are human. So if we look at donor behavior, we're looking at human behavior. Anyway, I'm already down the line. Why is it funny? I go out and I work, right? And I give up my time. I'm away from my family and I have to go and do work and get paid to do it. And then I take that hard-earned money and I give it to something that I believe in. <laughs> Like, if you really think about it, this is a weird exchange. Like, like it doesn't make sense. So it's funny. And then, and then it's funny because here we come in as fundraisers and we do all this wacky stuff and give ourselves ulcers and stress to get people to get into that generosity exchange and get all kinds of shenanigans going. It's just funny. Like, and, and, and also, can, can we please, can we start laughing about it? Because shouldn't that generosity exchange be joyous? Shouldn't that be fun? Oh, it's yeah. like the medicine to the fundraiser. Joy. Exactly. And being in relationship, I think the like joy often comes from the relationships you create with your donors. And I mean, sure, there are some stressful it relationships. It should come but, from the relationships yes, right, you right. with your donors. Right, <laughs> right it should. And, it but should. that's really the funny part, too, is looking at, okay, why isn't this joyous? And what are we doing that isn't funny? And maybe if we hold it up and laugh at it, we can actually realize how goofy it is. And then maybe do something different. Instead of continuing to suck the life out of it. Right. (laughs) Right. This is good. This is good. I like the frame. I like the idea, Mm -hmm. too, of um, the craziness of what we do and the craziness of the fundraising world, sort of having the antidote of joy and humor and enjoyment of your work. How important is that? Critical. Well, I think so. I agree. I agree. Well, Clay, you are a master of the now what. Like I said, you're so good at putting puzzle pieces together. And you so often have nonprofit organizations working with you that say, I have to do the end of year campaign and I have to do a direct mail piece and I have my big event and I can't think about anything else because I also have these other 30 million things to do. And you're really good at seeing clearly, where do we go from here? And so with most of our audience being connected to their gala. Many of our our listeners are thinking about their big event, are just recovering from their big event. Oh, bless. They're 
<laughs> right? <laughs> and then they put everything else on the back burner. How do you help a nonprofit figure out the now what? So events over, now what? So first thing, I just I, I will add my very first full-time fundraising job that I realized and understood the profession of fundraising. Because when you're in the theater and you're raising money, you're yeah. like, this is just what we do. And then you go and join like a nonprofit and you're like, oh, this is a real profession. Yeah. Really, my first real job, well, I was the special events person. Uh-huh. I did the gala every year. Lived it, right? Love it. Love you event folks. So here to support you. Um, <laughs> but you don't do it anymore. So but therefore. I don't do events anymore. <laughs> There. There's lots of good reasons There's, for that. There are good reasons. Yes, when when you know when I did events, I had a full head of wear hair and weighed 180 <laughs> pounds. So <laughs> you know, um, I, I do love events. I, I'm here to support them. And the now what? Right. Well, okay. For me, the now what, whatever it is, whether it's an event, whether it's an appeal, whether it's a campaign, whatever it is, we tend to think of fundraising as a very linear process, right? Yeah. Identify a donor, ask a donor, cultivate a donor, ask them, get the gift, repeat the cycle. Our whole donor life cycle is exactly that. It is a step-by-step, but fundraising doesn't work that way. Right. And anybody that's been doing it for any length of time knows that, no, it's not linear and it's not clean and it's not clear. Right. And it's a whole big, messy system. And if we start to think in systems rather than linear, and by a system, I mean multifunctional parts all working together to achieve a goal and a system maintains its balance through feedback. If we start to look at that, then the now what is just what's the next part of the system and where does it flow to? So in an event mindset, if we're talking about an event and we build the event and we invite them and we build all the excitement and we do all the PR and then we have them at the event and they come to the event and hopefully they give, hopefully they buy an auction item, whatever it is, however they engage with a particular type of event. And then we receive it and it's done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but we just had all these people in the room listening to our mission, talking about our message, right? Getting to know us. And some of them did and some of them didn't. What do we do now? Well, how do we keep them on the journey? Because we tend to go event donors. I don't know. Right. Did we give them the opportunity to be some other type of donor? Did we give them the opportunity to engage in a different way? And a lot of the now what takes systems development and investment, not in a huge way, not in a major way, but some point in the event planning process, stopping and going, what happens the day after the event, mm-hmm. right? Yep. What's what's the path? Because now I've got 200 or 300 or 5,000 people that have heard our name and know something about us. And where do we go to engage them? And can we make that a simple, executable systems approach that now they're part of, they're, you're part of the story now. Yeah. So come yeah. along and ride with us because everything else is going to get just as cool as, you know, that fancy dessert that you got. I love that you said you're part of the story now, because I think that there's a lot of thought that is, and research that's gone into communications to donors. And if you mm-hmm. have a system, and even to narrow it down specifically, if you have a database right. of your donors, a lot of those systems and tools allow direct communication where you can actually yep. send an email that says, Dear Clay, thank you for being here tonight. We are so excited to have you at the event. But in addition to that, you can add in the element of you language, almost removing the organization from the story narrative of you impacted this mission in this way so that you can really kind of pull the people into the story when you have that, um, you know, follow up or follow through. Yeah. hundred hundred percent. Absolutely. What we're doing when we're hosting an event, what we're doing when we're asking a donor. Okay. So, Funny story, well, funny-ish story, if I may. About 15 years ago, somebody came to me and and said, hey, what's the big deal about fundraising? It's just asking people for money. And at the time, I couldn't answer the question, you know, it's about relationships. People give to people, right? Standard responses, but I couldn't answer it in a way that satisfied me or satisfied him that it's more than just asking. And so that's what I started really intentional research and digging into and learning and exploring what is this thing we can't we call fundraising. And I came across this book. It's it's by Henry Nowen, who is a Catholic priest, theologian 
writer. He was asked to fundraise for his monastery and didn't want to do it and had the same fears that we all do. And so he went on prayerful study, et cetera. And he wrote a book called The Spirituality of Fundraising. It's a wonderful book for any fundraiser's library. Whatever your faith background is, there's some just nuggets of gold and wonderfulness in that book and highly, highly encourage it. What he said was, and and this hit me so much, it's actually on my business cards. Amazing. Fundraising is proclaiming what we believe in such a way that we offer other people an opportunity to participate with us in our vision and mission. Oh, yes. Fundraising is an invitation to come on this journey, this ride, this this promise that our vision and our mission make. It's not about dollars. Yeah. It yeah. is, but it isn't. Yeah, right? the dollars come. We, the dollars come. If we start to frame the idea that an event is a chance for us to tell the story of our mission and our vision and this big goal that we all have in front of us, whether it's, yep. you know, providing providing shelter for homeless people or, or, or pets or feeding hungry people or funding research, whatever it is, right, that we believe in it so much that we're willing and planning to have an event and bring people to it and spend weeks agonizing over tablecloth colors. Been there, done that. Yeah. No, right? Clay, we're not going to agonize over tablecloth colors. <laughs> you don't understand. There are donors who will only give to certain napkin colors. Oh. Like, not really. Not really, right? no. <laughs> but if that's what we're doing, if, if, if we believe in it so much that we're hosting this event and we're spending a lot of time and money doing it, what we're really doing is inviting these people to be a part of it, yep. right? Yep. And how do we get the you in it? It's not about us. People don't give to organizations. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. It is the hardest truth of fundraising and especially God love them. And here's my shout out to executive directors and board members, but <laughs> nobody cares about the organization. They don't. They care about the beneficiary. They care about the missionary. Right. You're just a conduit. Yep. And we as fundraisers are just there to facilitate and offer the opportunity for people to come on board with this mission to support and help people. That's what the story is. My question is, is why are we even in the middle? It's always about you. Yeah. It's always about the donor. But but let us let us add this very important caveat. That concept taken to the wrong degree is what leads us into donor dominance and into uh, yeah. um, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for, right? Exclusivity, it yeah. makes it, you know, we get into saviorism and all of that. So there is a fine balance between it. If we, st- I fully believe if we start to look at the work that we do as an equal balance between the organization and the mission, the beneficiary and the donor, it's three parts all working <gasps> together. And the number one priority is the beneficiary. It's the yep. holy as as trinity is going of to serve the beneficiary and the mission is there. We're just inviting donors to be a part of it. Yep. It's not about us at all. Yeah. Agree. Agree. Well, so you're taking us to church a little bit here. I want to mm-hmm. look at the <laughs> I want to look at the uh sort of starting point that you opened up about the importance of the system. And yep. so Let's talk a little bit about what that means of like, what is the system for continuing the evolution in the now what after an event? So I am not a data person by nature. I became a data person because I started to understand the power and implication Mm -hmm. that it has. Um, But there's, I mean, I failed college algebra twice, three times. (laughs) I'm not a math person. I'm not a data person. Um, I am ADD, though, and I did find that data is very soothing because it's mostly finite. Like, there's uh-huh. an answer or there's not. So, like, oh, it's so calming. Um, <laughs> but the system is about supporting that offer. The, the system is is built to support that offer and that invitation and that inclusion. Anything in your system that isn't working towards that needs to not be a part of your system or needs to be fixed. And we get kind of wound about, oh, my data doesn't work or my database doesn't do what I need it to do or I need this other shiny new tool or whatever, you know, blah, 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 right? And all of those things are true. I have found, experienced, and see a thousand times over again, if we invest in the system, make the system work for what we need it to do, Yeah. set it, nurture it. I don't say set it and forget it. Not Ron Popeil here. (laughs) 
<laughs> set it, nurture it, and then we can focus on the bigger things. It's when we're constantly having to go back to, well, I can't run the report because I don't trust the data, or the CRM doesn't do this thing, or you know, we don't have policies in place for how we handle silent auction, donation, purchases, whatever it may be, right? Take the time. It requires a pause. It requires an investment. Set the system and then let the system support what the goal is. And the goal is always, 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 how do we, the goal is always now what, right? Yeah. The goal yeah. is always now what? Now, now where are we going? Now where are we taking this donor? Now where do we need it to be? In the investment in systems, this is where it requires to, whatever the size of the shop, whatever your role in the organization, it really does require us as fundraisers to step into leadership yeah. and yep. convey to our CEOs, our boards, our bosses, et cetera, look, give me a month to clean up this data. I understand, but we're fighting the data right now. If yeah. I can stop fighting the data, I can spend more time out in the field meeting donors, Yep. right? I think it's, the now the now what on that though is once you have the data cleaned up and set up and you have the tool, stop making it the obstacle. Correct. Right? You're now liberated from complaining about the data and from <laughs> cleaning up the data and the data and the data and the data. So I'm I'm super interested in story, as we know. Mm -hmm. And I believe that numbers data have stories in them once you get them in the system and cleaned up and all the things. What are what are data stories that people should be looking for? What is it stories telling the us? Data, the stories in the data are the stories donors tell us. Oh, yep. Yeah. We talk about storytelling outbound. We talk about the story that we tell. What story are we telling? We don't talk about enough. What are the stories donors telling us? Yep. As simple as, what? how much information are they providing? What kind of contact information are they providing? Are they giving you full name, address, email, phone number? Are they just giving you just the bare minimum? What's the story they're telling us? We also live in a time when there is massive amounts of data that can be found about people. So whether we um, you know, whether we append data with third-party data like wealth intelligence platforms, wealth screening, those kinds of things, demographic data, whenever we're doing digital ads or anything like that, we're using, you know, additional data to identify potential targets. All of those things, all, all of this data and information now tells us so, so, so much more about who our donors are. If we're talking, though, about an organization that is fortunate to have history, yeah, yeah. And therefore has history in the data, those giving patterns and how donors give and what they've given and when they've given and where they give to are huge stories that they're saying to us and they're they're asking us to listen. This is the story I'm telling you. I'm telling you what you need to know about me. Are you actually listening to it? And we kind of get a little focused on our, we need them to behave this way. Yeah. yeah. We true. want them on this line and they're actually drawing right. the shape for us. Mm -hmm. Correct. 100%. So can I, can I give a quick example yes. of that? Yes, please. Like everybody's talking about donor retention. Absolutely true. You look at fundraising effectiveness project, average retention rate is 45%. Okay, sure. That's year over year. That's looking at this year compared to last year. It's good. It's not great. You know, it's great. Giving history over time, lifetime mm -hmm. value. Yep. When I do a database audit, I ask for, if I can get it, 10 years of history. And my data nerd friends go, 10 years, that's ridiculous. That's too much. Aha, yes. But if I look at a donor that has been on file for 10 years, what you see is what I call consistent but not consecutive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yep. So, right, to remove the timelessness of this, we're talking about this in 2023. So let's say their first gift was in 2013. They've been on file, quote unquote, since 2013. They gave two gifts in 2013. They didn't give in 2014. Then they gave in 2015. Then in 2016, they came to the gala. And then they took a couple years off, but then they gave four gifts in 2019. Like, they're all over the map. Right. Well, they don't behave in our binary retain year after year. Right. You know, yes. I guarantee you they are out there walking around going, of course I support ravaging wombats. That's who I am. <laughs> I'm a wombat supporter. <laughs> like, it's what I believe in. It's part of my core. It's part of who I am. And they think they're, you know, supporters. And we're going, 
dear John, we miss you as part of our donor family. And they're like, what are you talking about? Right? Yep. Right. It's funny. That speaks to me because we have a relationship with the nonprofit that um, we missed the gala one year. We missed it one year and we are no longer in their communication cycle. And this is an organization that year after year after year, we attended their events. We gave multiple different ways. We participated in online campaigns. We leveraged all kinds of relationships we had for in-kind support. Mm -hmm. And we missed one event. Like, you know, we had a family gathering that was a priority that year and we are no longer in their (laughs) communication cycle. So that idea of the donor being... Which means they're no longer in my donation (laughs) cycle. It's so sad, but true. (laughs) Well, out of sight, out of mind, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah, it's true. And I think the the level that you're speaking to of understanding the data is looking beyond just the column of they're an event donor. Oops, they didn't attend last year. (laughs) Goodbye. They're no longer an event donor. So I will... Or even better, if they are an event donor... All I have to do is make sure they're seated at a table and they'll still be an event donor. Right. Yes. That even if they haven't participated in that same way in the same structure, it it speaks to me of sort of the siloing that happens in the nonprofit sector that I am always trying to sort of bust apart. And Clay, I want to ask you about we look at the event donor as a specific subset of the donor base, but then we have the communication like chains and channels of direct mail, of our individual giving programs, of our donor portfolios. How do all of these interlace and intersect? If they come in through an event, are they now forever and always in all communication chains? Or do you do you segment? What's your strategy for thinking about the event yeah. donor outside of the event, but also inclusive to the organization? You want to hear a really wacky idea? Yeah. Totally. I ask them. <laughs> <gasps> Ooh. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is like next level strategy there. I think we just broke the internet. <laughs> um, and we're, we're joking about it because we have all lived it and fought it for so long. Yes. But honestly, I mean, honestly, 10 years ago, we couldn't do donor surveys. We didn't have the type of forms or technology that would yeah, support it. But now, true. my gosh, right? Yeah. So, yeah. all right. So, so let's, let's just say, for example, right? You host an event. And your board members and your key volunteers bring all these guests and the guests, you know, opt in at the event and give you their email address and they want to be involved. And you've got a phenomenal stewardship plan, um, which, hi, I know you're tired, you're exhausted. It was a tough event. It was a long weekend, but Monday, Monday. Monday. Thanks so much. It was so great to see you. We had such a great time. Here's a short snippet of some memories, you know, blah, blah, blah. What's that post-event Yep. Communications mm-hmm. thing, because I want to keep them warm and fuzzy, right, um, after the event. But at some point, maybe we go, hey, you know what? We had such a good time at the gala. It was so wonderful to see you. So grateful that you're there. We would love to stay in contact with you. How would you like to hear from us? I love that. That's and so give them good. the option. Not all systems can do it. I know. I know it's work. But if you can do it, and my goodness, we can do it with simple things. We can do it with a Google form now. Yeah, yeah that's true. Right? There are simple ways to attack it. It's just a matter of, is this a priority for us? Because I guarantee you, see, what I didn't say, my first job, I was the event person and also the grant writer. Oh. oh Did you do comms too? <laughs> I like, I, yeah, we don't want to talk about all the things that were underneath that hat, but like <laughs> I would finish the gala and then Monday I'd have to come in and be doing a logic model and, a you know, so now the next urgent thing has hit me when you build your systems, when you look at your systems, if, if we're going to buy into, and if we're going to believe in this, the story donors tell us that it's an offer and an invitation, how do you build your systems in such a way that you're prioritizing the post-event communications, the post-campaign communications, whatever it may be, that you're prioritizing that in equal measure to your, your napkin colors? Yes. Uh, right? I love that you keep coming back to napkin colors because we always talk about the centerpiece is the discussion yes. that like oh, yeah. controls the narrative for so long. But it is really about the relationship to the donor. So we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, I want to talk more in the like nitty gritty of how to do this, because I think it's important for folks to kind of think about the tools. So um, we'll be right back. Great. Awesome. At Elevate. 
We believe in bringing people together. Our online learning platform for fundraising events has webinars, workshops, downloadable tools, and more designed to save you time and stress when planning your next event. We're getting nonprofit, development, and event planning professionals the tools and ideas they need to create events that inspire donors and raise more money. So join us at elevatenonprofit.com. The link is also in our show notes. So welcome back. As we are talking about kind of the what next after an event, you were before the break talking a little bit, Clay, about the importance for engaging on that Monday morning and that like tired Monday, I just finished a big event and all I really want to do is take a nap. I have a couple of sort of quick resources that I like to provide organizations about what to do when you are so tired and want to take a nap. One, I recommend that some of this work actually be done either the night of the event or uh, pre-programmed in, and then you actually take Monday off. So, um, yeah, because then you can have meaningful, thoughtful communications to your donors. But couple of tools that we recommend. In most donor platforms, after the event, you can send an email and a text message now. If you are sending an email blast, it is really easy to also include the donor name in it. So having a pre-thought-out, pre-written yep. email all ready to go and, at the end, and with a blank spot in it of, thank you for helping us raise blank, The night of the event, we fill in that blank spot and we hit send. So, And we even write it assuming that the donor is reading it the night of the event. So it is, we are just packing the last of the boxes and cleaning out the space. And we're just so, uh, uh, you know, over the moon about what you were able to support tonight. And that sort of framing of, as you get home, we just wanted to say thank you and let you know that we raised this amount of money. The quick, easy communication. But the second thing that we often do is engage our video production team to actually create a little video clip or highlights reel. We call them the sizzle reel. That is a short little recap of the event because people want to see themselves and want to say, I was there and share that out. Mm -hmm. So having something that you can share out shortly, it could be within a week, but shortly after the event. But you probably have video assets from your event that you shared to the crowd And those are awesome to plug in for the Monday morning email to be able to say, if you missed it, we want to connect you to Sarah's story. Sarah bravely shared her story at the event. Here's a little clip. And being able to include that to all of your audience, not just your event donors, so that that is pre-programmed and that content is ready and preloaded. And then the last thing I would say is having your photographer provide you an image library that people can quickly access and share to their social media. So if you're able to send out our, you know, great photos from Saturday night, click here to get your photos. That is such a valuable resource because donors want to see themselves. Donors want to feel like they're a part of an organization and part of something. And sharing out those images kind of helps populate your post-event communication. So you can precede these things before, and then you can take Monday off. 100%. 100%. Can I offer three quick things on that? Yes, please. Yes. I was One. just, I was I, just going to ask, was gonna ask, I was <laughs> literally just going to ask you. So you go <laughs> top three. Um, <laughs> One, and I do this in appeal writing and campaign work as well. Write your thank you first. Yep. Oh, great strategy. Write your post event thing first. First thing you do, do it three months before the event, right? Yep. That's a Start great, with gratitude. That's a great way to visualize and manifest something too. Like as the Bingo. fundraiser, <laughs> my goal feels daunting when I look at it on paper. But I right. can write that thank you yep. note celebrating success. And now it feels a little bit more attainable. And use use it as your like I do this, I do this a fair amount in um annual fund and you know individual appeal stuff. Write the thank you letter first and you know, like slap it up on a wall, put it on your bulletin board, put it somewhere you see it because you go, that's what I'm working to. Yep. Yes, I've got a dollar goal. Yes, I've got you know napkin colors to do. I will tell you the napkin color story if you want to hear it at some point. But <laughs> but put that gratitude up first. It reframes how we think about it. It it gives a different goal set and a mindset that this is what I get to do. When this is all said and done, we get to celebrate and say right. thanks. And 
I listen, there's a lot of talk about thank you letters and thank you, gratitude and, and donor demands and all that right now. But wouldn't we all rather live in gratitude and appreciation yes. than, you know, stress and like, so, so number one, write that first. Number two, whatever, whatever methodology, whatever thing you use to capture information, again, the days of the formal stuffy white shirt, oh, this is all behind us. We can ask, this is going to shock you. We could ask donors, what do you want us to call you? Hmm. (laughs) In our forms, in our capture, we can say, hey, Sam, uh, Samantha, which is the name that I have on record, right? right? We'd love to stay in touch with you. When we send you an email, what would you like for us to call you? And you write in Sam, because... I cannot think of a single CRM, and I know a lot of them, that don't have a preferred name or salutation field or yeah, something right. that says, what do you want to call me? Because when I when I get something that's addressed to Dear Thomas, you didn't hear me. You didn't know me. Mm-hmm. You don't know me. And the na- Dale Carnegie, the sweetest sound in any language is the sound of a person's own name. <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> yeah. So let's ask them, what do you want us to call us? And three, I'm 100% with you, 100% on board. Totally, absolutely. People want to see the fun. They want to remember. I personally love sending videos like a week later too. Sure, yeah. Hey, here's another edit of, remember how much fun we had last week? Right, all of that. Let's also though be cautious about how we post it and what we say on social media. Yep. Because it's very easy and it's, important to post pictures of the event and every single one of your donors, every single one of your donors that got the invitation and went, I, I love this organization, but $250 for a dinner. Right. I can't. Right. You post all of that on social media and they're going, I guess I'm not important. Look at all the fun they had that I couldn't go to. Yeah. And also, I guess my donation isn't important because nobody, nobody celebrated me. Right. Nobody posted like, right. So it's, it's about, it's about inclusivity. It's about access. It's about diversity. Do we want to include all donors? I'm not saying don't post your social media and your videos and all that. I'm saying let's end the days of the big check pictures. Right. But, But also let's create an inclusive event. Yes. Bingo. So (laughs) there's an opportunity in that. Um, I think, too, sometimes it gets hard to understand sort of implications of things you don't intend. Meaning, I just got a form thank you letter from an event I attended deep deep into early spring. So it's Mm -hmm. now almost August. Finally got the thank you letter. Hey, it's got a little handwritten note on it, but I gave you, for me, a significant donation and didn't hear anything until this came, what are we, eight weeks now? Right. Ten weeks now? So the implication of that is that's going to start to play out in my donor story. Uh Uh-huh. And so how do we... How do we stitch that whole narrative together as organizations? How do we... How do we start to understand how we are also creating feedback loops that people are responding to? Uh, I'm going to commit some fundraising blasphemy. (laughs) Do it. This is why I've asked this question. Let's do it. But I'm going to do it within the rules and regulations of both FASB, Federal Accounting Standards Bureau, and the IRS. Great. Great. Thank you. Right? (laughs) Ethics. Yes. Yes. Um, And laws, right? Okay. The way the rules are written and the way the IRS statement, it is the donor's responsibility to get a written receipt for any gift they make and whether that's at an event or whatever, right? Yep. We have conflated the concept of receipt, acknowledgement, and thank you. They are yep, three yes. different things. They yes, are, right? they are. Now, first, you have to invest in that system. I'm sorry, but you do. You want to send an automated, pre-planned, you got to make sure the data is right, trust the data, make sure the names are right, all of those kinds of things. Fix whatever you can to make that as easy and as simple as possible. We do not have to send a receipt right away. You know what? Change your receipting process. If it's difficult to get receipts done because you got to export the event data from the event platform into the CRM and then accounting has to review it and it's got to be balanced and we can't send a receipt until that's all done, 
system, yep, okay, let that system do what it does, but you can acknowledge, right? Yes. Hey, you were there. We know, like, most donors are not sitting around going, I didn't get a receipt. I need a receipt. What did I spend? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And those that do itemize, and let's be very clear, since 2018, there are far, 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 yes. far, yes. far fewer of those. Yes. Let's also acknowledge tax incentives were never an incentive for giving. No. Correct. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> do you watch Ted Lasso? Yes. Oh, yes. Do you watch Ted yes. Lasso? Yes. The older I get, the more I'm becoming Roy Kent. And <laughs> I won't say it here, but I do spend an awful lot of time going. Hmm. Uh-huh. It's also the same use, uh, um, the same sound I use with the dogs when they grab the sofa pillows yet one more time. <laughs> um, anyway, right? Let's acknowledge. Let's make, we get wound up in, oh, we got to get the receipt, the receipt out. Change your system. Tell donors, we're going to send receipts once a month. We're going to send receipts once a quarter. Um, I, I've done this in a couple of organizations where we implemented a once a week, once a week, by Friday, our goal, we were going to acknowledge every gift that came in that week. Acknowledge it, not receipt it. We right. moved our receipting to once every month. The point was the longest a donor ever had to wait to get an acknowledgement that their gift had been received and was being put to use was five days. The quickest was one day. Uh Because we had our systems built to every Friday morning, all the gifts that were processed through midnight last night, boom. If you made a gift on Friday morning, you did have to wait a week. Okay, right? But then we did receipts once a month. It took so much pressure off of, we have to get this right. We have to get it done, blah, blah, blah. Our database manager, who was also multiple other hats, was able to go Friday morning, schedule four hours. And we all went, okay, we're not scheduling meetings because she's doing receipts Friday mornings. Like, like it, it's we. If we start to think we can do things differently, but the key is to to your question, what donors want is just acknowledgement. That's yeah, it. Just, it's I want true. to be seen. Yep, it's true. Yep, the best donor cultivation expert that we work with, the best development director we work with, she is so gifted at almost immediate response. She opens an envelope, sees that check, and drops a quick note that says, "Oh my gosh, I wasn't expecting you to give today. Thank you so much for your generosity." They have online campaigns that they run, and immediately we get an acknowledgement from her. It is a one line. It is less than a full sentence, but it is enough for us to know, oh, good, we're seen, we're valued, we're a part of this organization. It's super simple. The receipt is so secondary. Steal this language if you want it. Okay. I've I've used it in multiple organizations. Oh, but won't donors start to recognize it? Well, there's not that much crossover, right? Right. Dear Kristen. Wow, you are wonderful. Thank you so much for being a part of our event this week. It was great to see you there. We are working on getting all of the data pulled together and all of the facts and figures and and telling you what a tremendous impact that you had. We just wanted to pause just for a minute before we do anything else and say thank you. You are tremendous and we are so glad that you are on this journey of of ridding the world of ravaging wombats with us. (laughs) Thanks for being a part of it. In the next few weeks, you'll get a receipt, you'll get all the details, and we'll make sure that you know how to pick up your silent auction item. But for now, we just wanted to remind you and say thank you for being you. Wonderful you. Done. Yep. Done. Get Truth out. bomb. Yep. I All right. It. On that mic drop, let's take one more last break. Let's We're going to come back with a few little rapid fire questions. So awesome sauce. thank you very much. We'll be right back. The fundraising elevator is recorded at the AV department in Portland, Oregon. For years, they've been our trusted partner, delivering exceptional audiovisual production and videography for nonprofits. In 2020, they transformed into a dynamic live streaming studio, producing more than 900 virtual and hybrid events. Now, we embark on an exciting journey together to bring you this podcast. Seeking the best in live events, video production, and live streaming? We proudly recommend our friends at the AV department. Link in the episode description. All right. Welcome back. Well, we were just talking over the commercial break about it isn't that hard. And sometimes we overcomplicate. Sometimes we have competing priorities. Um, and we got lots of truth bombs from you today, Clay. So thank you so much for that. I want to just ask. It doesn't big, mean it's easy. It's not easy. Correct. Yes. If that's There's true. There's a difference. That is true. Um, but I want to ask big picture. When organizations do this work, when they invest in their systems, when they clean up their damn data and they have data they can trust and they know 
And they really think about what the communications to their donors are going to look like so that there are thoughtful communications and then there is the business of the communication. What is possible for an organization when they start to invest in this kind of work? Everything. (laughs) (laughs) Mic drop. I I think he got a tear in that eye. It's it's, it's kind of true. It would let you focus on what are the big... Don't get me wrong. All of this stuff is important. It really, really is. It's critical. Um, and there's been some conversation lately about AI can help us get rid of the mundane tasks like thank yous. Mm. <laughs> um, if a thank you is mundane, I'm going to ask you to rethink your priorities. That said, you do have bigger fish to fry. And we do have small shops where, you know, your database ad, your database admin is also, you know, running programs at night or whatever it may be, right? Fix the systems, get the pain points out of the way. Yeah. Right. Reset that priority, reframe it and think about offering and inviting versus asking and right receding and get the system to work to support you. Recognize you'll need to nurture it, but then you can focus on other bigger things, identifying new donors, um, expanding the mission, whatever it may be. Right. It's it's when we get so bogged down in things that don't support us well. And and let's acknowledge, like, not all of us. I'm not a data guy. I had to learn it, but I had the luxury to do it. I had a boss that supported it. I'm lucky in that, right? We have so many things that that affect us. Get, build your knowledge, get firm in knowing what your system needs to work better and what's going to support you better so that you can go do the things that are most important or more important or, 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 Yeah, we're going to Marie Kondo fundraising here. What brings you joy? (laughs) Yeah. Everyone should Marie Kondo fundraising, I think. Agreed. It's true. So at the fundraising elevator, we get in and ask, we ask folks the the two questions, which are, we're going to go up to the penthouse first. Uh Uh-huh. What is a great event that you have been to and what made it great? It was the, I'm, I'm not going to name it because it would make it really identifiable. Yes. Um, um, it was the event that was kind of gala-ish, but the entry price point was relatively low. I want to say like an individual ticket was like 50, 75 bucks. And it was jeans, t-shirts, and tennis shoes. Oh, and yes. And fun mm-hmm. food that was mission-related. And the whole program was like 15, maybe 20 minutes. Brilliant. And I know I, we, we, we see this differently. I know and I support Celebrate Champion Your Success. I personally, I don't, I don't love the, the, the live um, auction yeah, power no, raise. No, we're with stuff. you, we're friend. With you. We're with you. It's, um, it's a, about a tell your story, in, get in, get yeah. out. <laughs> well, I'm a big believer in the fun of events. You know yeah. what? If I'm going to have a big sign on auction, right? Or an opportunity for people to give at the event, what I want is I want them to stay. Mm-hmm. Like, come here, find yourself here in this mission, make things mission related and important, have fun. Because next year, when I invite you, I want you to say, God, they do a great event that is so much fun. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes, you right. want to be memorable. And it, talking heads on a stage for four hours is not memorable. I don't care what your content is. It's just not memorable. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, agreed. Agreed. Um, I, I love your board chair. She is wonderful, truly <laughs> a, a remarkable leader. She is a lousy public speaker. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay, we're going to get back in the elevator. We're going to go down to the basement where all the tools live. Top, <sighs> top three tools a fundraiser should have. Are we talking event specific or in general? Let's general. general. Number one, a CRM that you trust and does the things that you need it to. Um, that's also number two and number three. Okay, great. I love it. Sorry. <laughs> Don't be. <laughs> so when you have a CRM that you trust and you need and does what you need it to do, I think it requires that you've done the work and you've put in the work. And I know that that can be a daunting task. You've encouraged everyone to go in, clean the data, understand the data. Um, In that, I also want to offer that there are resources you can get to get support with data. 100%. I know that you, Clay, 
do data audits. That's um, a nice segue. Well done. <laughs> yes. Subtle. But I also, I, I did, because I think that it's important for folks to think about what is the tool that I have that I can move this forward. And if yep. they don't have the capacity, having someone else come in and do an audit of your database, identify yeah. where their time and attention needs to go is just a great resource. But Clay, we want to make sure people can get a hold of you. You have yep. other resources to offer. I want to know about that beautiful planner sitting over your shoulder because you've made a very generous offer that the fundraising planner is available to our listeners at a lovely 25% off using the code elevator. So um, can you tell us just a little bit about what the fundraising planner is? So um, a friend of mine and I are both, you know, empty notebook planner dorks. Um, the bookshelf right underneath that one is full <laughs> of half written in planners and blah, blah, blah. And we were talking about our joint love for it. And one day we went, wouldn't it be great if there was a planner built just for fundraisers? Because, you know, if you're using a traditional planner, like it doesn't have a place for tracking your goals or entering your metrics or, you know, the fundraising specific stuff. And then we went, Oh, then we'll just create one. So we did. <laughs> um, and <laughs> the intent it. behind it is it is very much just like a standard planner. So it starts with your personal goals, your vision for the year, all of that. It's built on, um, we dug deep into time management te techniques and, and goal setting and all of that. So it helps you set your personal goals. It helps you set your, um, your fundraising goals. Um, and it's built chronologically. So you don't have to flip back from... Uh, daily to quarter to blah. It takes you through the whole year. It starts with the quarter. What's my goals for the quarter? Then it goes to month. What's my goals this month? And then there's a daily page for what you do. And it, and it has like prompts for here's the five donors that I'll call this week. Here's the three stewardship activities that I'll take this week. And there's a reflection page where it's, you know, what did I do well? What did I not do well? What could do, go better? Right. So it's pretty much got just about every planning tool that a fundraiser would need. It is not a fundraising plan, although it'll help you execute one. Great. Dreamy. Well, um, to me, it looks and sounds like you have created something that takes all of the notes, all of the yellow pads, all of the, you know, phone messages, post-its, and yep. put it into one easy location. So thank you for thinking of all of us and providing it's, us a tool. It's also... We wanted it to be kind of fancy schmancy. Yeah, so like, it is you fancy. Could, you could walk into a meeting with this and, you know, look professional. Because sometimes, let's, I mean, let's be honest, right? Fundraisers, listen, stick a whole bunch of post-it notes in here and yeah. carry a pen and just walk real fast through the office. And people will be like, <laughs> oh, he's so busy, so efficient. Look at that. Mm, right? <laughs> well, thank you for your truth bombs. Thank you for joining us today. Thankful. Thank you for all of the like hat sorting you do in the nonprofit world because I feel like you are the puzzle master helping people figure out now what. And we are so glad to have you join us. I am beyond grateful. Um, you all, you all have uh, changed and impacted the profession. I'm just lucky and fortunate to get to uh, to get to come along with you on this, and the the feelings back uh, are just 100 percent mutual. So thank you. Well, you're a dream, and I hope people tune into Fundraising is Funny and listen to you and Lynn just giggle away as you talk about the joy of fundraising, mm -hmm. because yeah. Lynn Wester is an another amazing, brilliant partner in this work. And so thank you for bringing that into the world. And um, for all of our listeners, I hope you tune in and check it out, too. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for joining the Fundraising Elevator, and we'll be uh, tuning in next time. Thanks so much. Thank you all. The Fundraising Elevator is produced in partnership with Swaim Strategies at the studios of the AV Department. The program is produced by April Clark and directed by Steve Osborne, with audio engineering and original music by Dwayne Anderson and Heidi Christensen. Video production by Chris Peterson, Whitney Gomes, and Nathan Bouquet. Video editing by Steve Osborne. Graphic design by Pendulum Creative Group. And support from Sophia Keller, John Lyles, and Andy Dowsett.